Thank you very much. Our next speaker, uh, following the anecdote, uh, as it did decades ago from Joachim to Harriet Zuckerman. When it comes to the sociology of intellectual life and its institutions, there are few figures of the last 40 years who have made as important an impact. She is now Professor Emerita in the Department of Sociology at Columbia University, where she taught from 1965 to 1992. Uh, she then moved to the Mellon Foundation as Vice President and then Senior Vice President and now Senior Fellow. She is the author of several books, including Scientific Elite, Nobel Laureates in the United States, 1977, enlarged in 1996. Co-editor of Towards a Metric of Science, The Advent of Science Indicators, 1978. Science Indicators, Implications for Research and Policy, 1980. The Outer Circle, Women in the Scientific Community, 1991. And most recently, Educating Scholars Examining Doctoral Education in the Humanities, 2009. There are also many, many papers in scholarly journals on topics such as the careers of Nobel laureates and the sociology of the Nobel Prize, the theory of accumulation of advantage and disadvantage, intellectual property rights, the careers of men and women scientists, post-mature discoveries in science, theory choice, and problem choice, age and age structure in science, refereeing in scientific journals, and the emergence of scientific specialties, graduate education in US universities. She's been awarded fellowships by the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, the Russell Sage Foundation. She's been elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Philosophical Society, and has honorary degrees from the University of Warwick, in the University of Budapest. It's a pleasure to welcome uh, to the Bard Graduate Center, Harriet Zuckerman. First of all, I can report that Joachim Nettlebeck's account of that dinner corresponds perfectly with mine, and I can tell you that given the chance, Bob Merton told everybody to write what they were doing that interested him. Now, he wasn't always successful, but the fact was that you were um, one of a long line of those he attempted to direct in the, to do things he wanted them to do. Well, I'm delighted to be here and to be part of this anniversary celebration. And that's all apart from the fact that the agenda of the session this afternoon deals with questions that have occupied and perplexed me for years. This afternoon's agenda is formidable. I don't know whether you have really looked at it. But it calls for the exploration of research institutions, the definitions of good research, the necessities for research, necessity of research for teaching, and for good measure, research as a way of life. Peter Miller obviously thought that uh, that might not be enough to keep us busy. So I got my own agenda as to what I was supposed to do including, for example, why basic research in the humanities is important and why it's worthwhile to spend money on it. And as I heard today, um, I was also asked to, re to reflect most particularly on basic research but not applied research. Well, Peter, I'm going to do both. And, of course, this really difficult problem of how you can decide whether basic research, especially basic research, before it has even been done when you're dealing with requests for money, how you can decide whether it's worthwhile or not. Well, all this can't be dealt with in one small paper. And I feel that what I have here is much too long 
and that I'm going to have to do some radical surgery um, as time goes on. So it now is 3.13, and I have until when, Peter? Uh, <laughs> it's dark there. Yeah, it's about 3.45. Okay. Um, this will not be a report on my research, although I can't resist mentioning some of it. Nor will it review the relevant literature, though, of course, I will use some of that. Instead, I'm going to try to, to deal with some of these questions based on my own experience. Let me say a little more about that, uh, that experience that Peter has so graciously described. First, I've just come off of 21 years at the Andrew Mellon Foundation. The Mellon name is attached to a large array of benefactions in the arts and humanities. Um, we like to say that Mellon has provided more financial support for those fields than the National Endowment for the Humanities and the National Endowment for the Arts, the two principal government agencies in the United States for um, nourishing those activities. Mellon has, has provided more money than both combined. Uh, it says something, of course, about the reluctance of the uh, Congress to have much to do with those activities. Well, while I was at Mellon, I oversaw the foundation's grants to universities, the humanities, graduate education, research and research institutes, research libraries, scholarly organizations, and all manner of fellowships and professorships. Um, there are Mellon Fellows and Mellon Professors, it seems, everywhere. Um, I also participated in the Foundation's ongoing research on higher education, and that's when I started to do studies on the humanities that were like the studies I had done on scientists. Well, I can't tell you whether giving money away is more blessed than receiving it. I can certainly tell you that it's more satisfying than asking for money, which I did for the 30 years I was a professor at Columbia. In that stage of my life, I was a supplicant, not just for my own research, but for support for my department when I was the chair, and for my students. It was not taken for granted that anyone was, going, was entitled to, to money. Well, it was part of the job, and it was part of the job of a professor in a big research-driven institution. But seeking money wasn't the, all I learned to do. What I learned was that educational institutions, if they are to be anything, have to be homes for vigorous debate among faculty and students and faculty that being agreeable is really not useful. <laughs> they almost always, these debates almost always infuse energy into teaching as well as research, but they do so in unpredictable ways. Sometimes debate, at least in my university, turned into high drama, an indication of how strongly people felt about their ideas which is well and good. But I'm not convinced that, it's, that high drama is generally conducive to good research or effective learning. Well, third, I speak from years and years of time spent on academic committees, on commissions, editorial boards, which I now know provided hands-on research, hands-on instruction in the evaluation of research that Peter assigned to me. And last, I'm a sociologist of science. Now you surely haven't any idea what that means. I observe scientists, this is the, the rhetoric I've developed, I observe scientists observing nature. I observe how researchers and institutions interact and how they collectively produce knowledge. Put another way, my research was on research and researchers. 
Because of this, many of the examples I'm going to use will come from the sciences. At Mellon, I essentially spent my time with humanists, and so I've learned a lot about the humanities and humanists. But scientists have always been people who have interested me, and um, it's become quite clear that humanists and scientists, while they differ in a lot of important ways, they do come out of the same intellectual traditions, and they are devoted. I was very happy to hear the word truth in these walls, since it's not always the case in the um, halls of universities here and abroad that truth is mentioned with some degree of um, positive valence rather than it's being denied to exist. Um, in any event, um, that experience in the sociology of science will have been very important for, for what I'm going to say today. Um, I'll begin then by commenting on what basic research is and then turn to that phrase, potentials of relevance, in my title. I really don't want to bore you with definitions, um, nor do I want to make pronouncements about what basic research entails. But as a shorthand, let me at least list some of its more important attributes. Basic research entails the use of systematic procedures. As Peter said, I was glad to hear that word systematic. Systematic procedures that foster new understandings, that foster the uh, understanding of phenomena of a great variety of kinds, that identify new uniformities, that aim to understand how those uniformities come about, and to understand what they mean. Sometimes research also can produce a sense of what its implications are going to be, but not always. I know that this effort to define research is both crude and unsatisfactory. It doesn't hint at the differences that exist not just between research and the sciences and humanities, but even within the humanities. What, for example, uh, students of poetry do is very different from what historians do. In the former case, the very close study of texts is not the same thing as the study of the archives, which historians depend on. Also, I'm not so sure that all of the humanities are much interested in establishing new uniformities. Surely historians are, but that isn't necessarily true of other kinds of research in the humanities. And it says nothing about basic research and how it might differ from applied research. I find it even a little difficult to think about applied research, as you'll discover in the humanities, but I've made a little dent on that. Um, when we think about basic research, essentially what we think about is research being done for its own sake, for finding new knowledge, for not being concerned with solving either practical or impractical problems. The spirit of basic research is very well exemplified by the toast that the mathematician G. H. Hardy is said to have made. He raised his glass and said, here's to pure mathematics. May it never be of use to anyone. <laughs> to my mind, Hardy advocates more purity than most basic research requires. The subtext of his comment, I think, shows a contempt for practical application and implies that use somehow debases ideas and outputs and that the life of a mathematician should not involve doing anything useful. 
Well, if you think about it, outcomes of basic research in the humanities inform our thinking, provide historical and philosophical context, and make us aware of the complexities of the problems being addressed. But rarely do they involve discoveries in the sense of that meaning in the sciences, though they sometimes do. This distinction is not hard and fast. There are plenty of examples of research having major applications that was in the, uh, in the, the uh, beginning basic research. I think all of you know about Watson and Crick's double helix, and it is abundantly clear that they knew that what they had done would be of earth-shaking importance. But they certainly didn't foresee that their discovery of the structure of the hereditary part of the gene could be used in such diverse areas as police work that would allow policemen to identify who might be guilty from who might not be guilty, that it would be used in the production of foodstuffs through genetic engineering, that it even might turn up in archaeology, as in a recent story I read in the New York Times, which I can't tell you why I found so enchanting, but I did. The Times reported that the DNA of pig remains, ancient pig remains, in Israel show that the pigs in Israel, some pigs in Israel, came from European strains and not Middle Eastern strains. And that that discovery raises all kinds of questions, such as when and how and why European pigs got to, to Israel in the first place. Certainly not what Watson and Crick had in mind in the first, but when they did their research. Correlatively applied research can have fundamental outcomes. And let me give you two more examples from the sciences. The discovery of the existence of what was called cosmic microwave background radiation, that's a mouthful, in the sky by two physicists at Bell Laboratories began as a study of why static really plagued long distance telephone lines. That's a pretty applied research. Well, this, the work that Penzias and Wilson did ended up in providing de the, the demonstration for the Big Bang Theory of the origins of the universe. I can't think of a more basic contribution than that. The, the cases that I've described teach us a couple of things. First, that the intentions that researchers have when they do the work, what they hoped to do, whether they wanted to extend knowledge or solve problems, is a poor guide to determining whether the research is basic or applied. It's also the case that where the research was done, whether it was at Cambridge in England where Watson and Crick, Watson and Crick worked, or at the Bell Labs, it's a very poor predictor of whether the research is going to be basic or applied. Academic researchers sometimes do applied research, and researchers in uh, for-profit laboratories sometimes do quite basic research. Really, beyond that, the same piece of research can be both applied and basic, depending on where in time you're looking at it, so they can be hybrids in a way that is not generally recognized. So I'm not really um, convinced that it's worthwhile to try to be too clear what basic and applied research really are, other than saying that they're different, but that the differences are fluid, time-dependent, and only loosely linked to the intentions of researchers who have done it and where they do their work. Well, now for basic 
research with potentials of relevance. When Peter Miller and I first discussed um, how basic research in the humanities might be become attractive to supporters, even though it had no bankable outcomes, I was immediately reminded of potentials of relevance. Apparently, Peter liked the term and the idea just as much as I did. But that term and idea is not mine. It belongs to the Robert Merton that Joachim Nettlebeck described. Those of you who have not read Bob Merton um, do not know, although it may have, these ideas have really diffused into the, car, into the, the collective conversation more than many, 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 many other sociological ideas. I call your attention only to his work on self-fulfilling prophecies, on identifying what role models are, on unant the unanticipated consequences of purposive action, theories of the middle range, and, as Joachim Nettlebeck noted, the role of serendipity in research and research organizations. Bob Merton was my teacher, my collaborator, my partner, and my husband. And I have to tell you, citing one's husband is really a pleasure. <laughs> he came to think about this notion of potentials of relevance of basic research when he was an advisor to a big American insurance company. That may seem like a rather undignified way to spend the time of a very distinguished scholar, but it interested him. He was struck by how much he thought the company would benefit from knowing more than it knew than simply death rates, more uh, morbidity rates, uh, and actuarial information. He thought that, for example, if they could learn more about the general meaning of death for different groups, whether they could understand attitudes toward the need to protect families, which is what insurance usually is for, or what it's like to be a widow or a widower. He thought that this, ki this company would benefit from establishing a program of basic research that would be relevant to an insurance company, just as relevant as research that's supported by uh, drug firms or energy companies or biotech firms. In the paper, Potentials of Relevance, he observed that scientists since the 17th century have had to justify their search for fundamental knowledge and persuade donors to pay for it. This was as true of the great figures of the 17th century, like Robert Boyle. He was the man who formulated the Boyle's Law, some of us learned about in high school chemistry. As true for, for Robert Boyle as it has been in la the later period. As time passed, scientists made a little dent in persuading donors that basic research might possibly have useful outcomes. You might know that Ben Franklin, our Ben Fla Franklin in Philadelphia, was once asked, what good is a discovery? What good is a scientific discovery? And Franklin turned, in return said, what good is a newborn baby? Well, that implies in it that you can't really say, but that there is some, something there that uh, is worthy of a consideration. Well, it's also true that basic research doesn't always have useful implications. And it's also true that donors seem to forget, even when they were once convinced that it did, that good outcomes can come from it. 
that is outcomes in their interests. Investors in basic research usually want to be given some idea of what might eventuate from the work they underwrite. There are a few who are willing to simply go ahead. I think of them as a little bit like investors in plays on Broadway. They don't know what's going to come from their investment, and they also know they're likely to lose their shirts. Now, it's, one doesn't want to repeat that, but that is really the case. Merton's idea was to think of outcomes of basic research as being arrayed on a continuum, with some of it being relevant, having potentials of relevance, and others not. And as long as you have the idea that some of it does have potentials of relevance, it's possible to describe to donors why that's the case. And it's also possible for donors to understand that the investment might be useful. When Bob Merton wrote this piece on potentials of relevance, he didn't intend it to be applied to the humanities. And I do think the fit is a little bit uneasy. But I can imagine, for example, that political or legal or medical or social welfare organizations, even corporations, might be persuaded to support basic research in the humanities because it might be of use to them. But they need to understand that the humanities are very unlikely to produce discoveries like science. Humanists, although some do, historians do make discoveries. Even people who study rhetoric may make discoveries. But discoveries are rare. They need to understand that what they are paying for is a better understanding of the contexts in which they operate and the meanings that are, infer that are implied in the circumstances that they are asked, that, that they uh, confront. And that the chances of solving practical problems are not very great. I can say as a long-term denizen of the Mellon Foundation, I learned that it's up to researchers to make their best case. And if they can't tell you why they want to do what they want to do, and if they can't tell you why it's important and what they expect to get from it, then support's going to be very hard to come by. Well, why then should basic research in the humanities be supported? I've made a stab at answering that, but most of all in the humanities, if you think about, about the fact that it does deal with phenomena of high social importance, high social and, social and cultural importance, that one can make the case. Let me give, give you two examples. Historians, as you know, are increasingly interested in learning about the extent to which American universities benefited from the institution of slavery and the support of slaveholders. That's basic research. But it has huge social implications. It has social implications if only that individuals outside universities are a very important source of support for them. And they need to understand the history of these institutions just as they are often dealing with their sentimental attachments to where they went to school. Another research focused on, hum humanistic research fo focuses on instances of genocide and retribution, on similarities, for example, between the events in Bosnia or Nazi Germany or Rwanda, and learning about those takes us into domains where 
basic research in the humanities has large, large implications. Having said that, I'm going to take up Peter's second challenge, which is how central is basic research to the life of academic institutions. And I'm going to give you essentially the same answer he gave you, that along with teaching, it is at the heart of these institutions. There is, in fact, a substantial literature on the functions of universities. Depending on your tastes, you might turn to Cardinal Newman's idea of the university, first published in 1852, or to Alfred North Whitehead's essay, Universities and Their Functions, of 1927, or Abraham Flexner's <laughs> Universities, American, English, and German, of 1930, or more recently, Clark Kerr's uses of the university. Clark Kerr was president of the University of California and is a wonderfully plain-spoken and wise academic admin administrator. But it turns out that Whitehead, Whitehead really commented on the importance of research for universities in the most direct way among this group of, I guess they are loci classici. Whitehead wrote, the university is imaginative or it is nothing. Imagination can only be communicated by a faculty whose members themselves wear their learning with imagination. In saying this, Whitehead says, I am only repeating what, one, what is the oldest of observations. The whole art in the organization of a university is the provision of a faculty with imagination. I go on. The two functions of education and research meet together in a university. Do you want your teachers to be imaginative? Then encourage them to do research. Do you want your researchers to be imaginative? Then bring them into intellectual sympathy with the young at their most eager, imaginative period of life. Make your researchers explain themselves to active minds plastic with the world before them and make young students crown their period of intellectual acquisition with contact <coughs> with minds that are nourished by research. Well, as Whitehead implies, universities have two general purposes, to create knowledge and to pass it on. Some writers about universities also comment on their obligation to contribute to the general social well-being, whether to make the society more, more egalitarian, to promote ethical behavior, to promote citizenship. This third set of functions is, I think, more characteristic of undergraduate education than professional and postgraduate education, but to deny that there isn't this strong um, strain in thinking about universities, I think, is to do a disservice. In addition to adopting this rather formal view, that is saying because this is what universities are, of course, they must do research, is implied, comes in the, you know, close to the surface in Whitehead. Professors who do research energize, excite, stimulate, their students and their colleagues, and in terms are stimulated by them. Their colleagues also stimulate them, and either by being directly helpful, which they sometimes are, or by being competitive, which they also sometimes are, they lead people to do better research than they might have done otherwise. I'm fully aware, and I think this is something that we we really have to start thinking seriously about that colleges and universities are just at the beginning of huge changes in the way they do business. 
the outcomes of the new digital teaching technologies are impossible to predict. The rapid changes in the financing of education in the United States and in Europe and elsewhere means that there are all kinds of changes occurring in access to higher education, who gets to have it, in the recruitment of teachers, in the allocation of responsibilities among faculty, and in who is to pay for what universities do. For my purpose, the fact that the faculty is being reshaped in front of us, that there are more faculty members in American institutions who are not full-time and who, if they are full-time, have no promise of ever getting tenure. The fact that the tenure ranks is shrinking quickly means that who does research and the circumstances in which it's done and how it affects teaching is, um, I think, a great unknown. Last is the really important problem of assessing research. And let me say that in principle it's very difficult. In practice, we do it all the time. Um, it is um, what we do with students. It's what we do with our colleagues' work. It's what we do when we read journals. It's what we do when we read books. Assessment is part of, of research, is part of the, the nature of life in a university. But I needn't tell you that experts disagree on what good research is, and I should warn you that do not believe scientists when they say that they always know what good research is and that they can rank one by one by one the best chemist or the best mathematician or the best biologist. It's simply not true. Um, my colleagues, Jonathan and Stephen Cole, um, did research on proposals sent to the National Science Foundation and how panels assess them and what they found what that there was were a small number of proposals that everyone agreed were excellent, and there was also a small number of proposals that everyone agreed were just awful. But in that great middle area, that great gray area, there was an enormous amount of disagreement. Well, if there is such disagreement in the sciences, we should expect there to be similar disagreement in the humanities. Let me tell you about another little piece of research that you picked up, Peter. Um, many years ago, uh, I was involved in a study of refereeing in scientific journals. That came about because the Physical Review, which was the main journal in the field of physics, was going to throw out its archives. And the editor knew something about my interest in the sciences and said, would I like to come and look at their archives before they throw them out? Well, the very thought absolutely terrified me. So I went out to Brookhaven on Long Island and looked into the files. And what I found were not only original letters from Einstein and Enrico Fermi and you know, the, the leading lights of modern physics, what I found was that they had incredibly good records on who refereed particular papers who the authors were, and what the outcomes were. So it enabled me to find out how much, for example, what the rates of rejection rate were in this physics journal, and how much referees agreed with one another when they read papers. And what I found to my great surprise was that about 90% of the papers submitted to the physical review were printed. That's a lot. And furthermore, that the referees agreed about two-thirds of the time, which is better than chance. Well, that led Bob Merton and me 
to do a research on acceptance rates in journals in 32 other fields. And what we found, counter to our assumptions, was that it was easier to get work published, that is, more papers were accepted in the sciences than in the social sciences, and hardest of all, to get a paper published in the humanities. Very, very difficult. In trying to explain that counterintuitive finding, we decided that scientists learn very early what impossible papers look like, and they just don't submit them. And that humanists, either because they disagree on standards or they don't communicate them to their students, to one another, are more likely to send things in for publication that the editor can simply look at and say, this just won't do. I'm not even going to bother referees to make a judgment. Well, when I worked at Mellon, I found that the the panels I put together of some eight or ten very distinguished humanists in various fields, they didn't all agree with one another, but they were really helpful in making decisions about how money was to be spent. These were very savvy people, enormously learned, sometimes wise even, and um, that I was ended up being convinced that collective judgments of this kind led us to be more fair, more rigorous, and to take chances on work that might not be immediately um, appealing. I'm going to skip what I had to say about subjectivity in assessment because my time is over. I'm going to say one thing about the development over the last 20 years or so of metrics to assess the quality or influence of publications, what's called citation analysis. Um, I could speak for hours on that subject. You don't want to hear me speak for hours on that sub subject. So all I'm going to say is the use of citation analysis in the humanities to assess the quality or the influence of work is very flawed. It's very f flawed if only because the databases which are used for deriving the counts of citations count only publication in journals while in the humanities books are the central um, vehicle for contributions. Recent research that I've read makes me really uneasy about using such metrics. So I suggest caution when you read about them. Deans are given to counting the citations to people up for promotion, to counting citations of departments, to trying to objectify the quality of work for which they're responsible. I'm not convinced you can objectify the quality of work. And I'll have something to say shortly about that. Well, my students would ask me what the takeaways are of what I have said. And the first is that basic research in the humanities, as in the sciences, can be thought of as having potentials of relevance. That it is also true that research in the humanities is far more often done for its own stake and for the extension of knowledge that research is central to the life of academic institutions by definition, and that it feeds them and their principal functions in ways that simply cannot be uh, arrived at otherwise. Last, in assessing quality, it's just really hard. And there are strong reasons to be skeptical about the metrics I, of citation analysis, 
and strong reasons, too, in being skeptical about using expert judges. In general, it's better to use multiple measures and multiple judges. But there's no easy way out of the fundamental problem of assessing the, the quality of knowledge produced in the humanities. That being said, and emphasizing the ambiguity that assessment involves, I'm just not willing to concede that ambiguity is a license for anything goes. Some measure of tolerant flexibility is always in order, but denying that all research contributions simply defy judgment, I don't think is of value to anybody, to the pursuit of knowledge, or to assessing the contributions of one's colleagues. Thank you. Thank you very much.